Welcome everyone to episode 87 of Manifesting with Meg, conversations with extraordinary people. I can't believe I'm on episode 87. I know I say that all the time, but it just makes me smile thinking about all 87 or this will be 87 conversations I've had with such incredible, extraordinary people. Tonight, I bring you a special guest, Elizabeth Meredith. She is the author of Pieces of Me, and her book was adapted to a Lifetime movie coming up on March 5th, which I encourage all of you to go watch. It's called Stolen by Their Father. This is going to be epic because it is a full circle moment where the pain and of her struggle is now going to help others by communicating that part of her story with others. And I love the theme tonight is educate yourself through love. And I always say love is the thing that's going to heal us all. So without further ado, I take you to transformation, dreams, inspiration, true happiness, discovering bliss. Remember, you're always a conversation away from extraordinary. It is time to wake up to the universe packed with possibility. Without further ado, this is a monthly inspirational show that follows the categories in my wonderful book, The Magical Guide to Bliss, which I'll show you guys now. Tonight, like I said, the theme is educate yourself through love. We always set our intentions at the outset and we, oh, excuse me, and we share at the end of our interview where you pick a number, Elizabeth, and we have that number corresponding to a page. I'm sorry, your intention corresponding to a page in my book. We all know the drill, 87 episodes in. I think we all do. Without further ado, I introduce all of you to the beautiful and, like I said, mm -hmm. effervescent Elizabeth Meredith. Welcome, Elizabeth. I'm so happy to Thank have you, you Meg. here. I am so happy to be with you. This is exciting and I really appreciate that you're doing this for me. So thank you. You are so welcome. And you know, that's kind of full circle. You interviewed me back in the, like back months ago and uh, where we connected through the whole idea of both of us coming out of a career involving, you know, the government into a world involving creativity, certainly telling our stories and sharing those memoirs with the world. Yours was already out. Mine was going to come out soon. And I just love the fact that we're having this conversation tonight on this beautiful in Miami, February evening. You're in Tennessee, correct? Correct. Yes. But when you and I spoke the first time I was in Alaska where I lived you for were. more than 50 years. So yes, this you is were. different. You were. So we're moved to a different side of the country, I suppose now. So I, yes. I want to make sure everyone knows who you are, this beautiful person that I'm speaking to. Margo is saying that she loves listening to both of us. And Rachel Mitchellberg says hello from California. Welcome, you guys. This is going to be a fantastic conversation tonight. So without further ado, Lisbeth Meredith is an author, speaker, online teacher, and coach who recently, like she said, moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee after more than five decades in Alaska. She holds a bachelor's degree in journalism and a master's degree in psychology. Her first memoir, Pieces of Me, Rescuing My Kidnapped Daughters, became an Amazon bestseller and is now a lifetime television movie stolen by their father. She helps introverted non-techie authors, there's so many of us, right, <laughs> understand the principles of book marketing with her online course and coaching and connects with midlife women to recalibrate. I'm sorry, recalibrate after a life of being last on their list. So with and all of us who have children out there or anyone for that matter, pretty much understand that at this point. <laughs> I, I definitely want to once again, highlight the fact that you are retired probation supervisor. You previously worked as a child abuse investigator and domestic violence advocate and became a trainer in trauma informed care and adverse childhood experiences studies. Wow, you know, and wait, guys, there's more. She has her own podcast and she spends time interviewing on Persistence You with Lizbeth. I told you I had the wonderful experience of having a chat with her on that. And she also is the mother of two adult daughters and grand pets, right? So yes. without further ado, very exciting to have you. We have everyone who's just like wowing on the sidelines. And, and I just really am so excited to have you and have this conversation tonight, because I think it's really important at this point in time, like we were saying in the green room, so to speak, you know, we have so many 
steps on this wonderful journey to see our books come to light, to see our careers come to light. It's a very exciting time for you now that we're looking at about a, a little over a week now that you're going to have your movie, Lifetime movie, shown to the world that's based upon your story. So it comes to life where people can actually feel the words from your book come alive, which is amazing. Very things, very exciting things happening in your world. Um, you know, I'm going to give you the first word because I think I really need to hear from you. How do you feel right now, Elizabeth? Well, I'm so excited to be with you and to see Margo. Margo was just visiting me and now she's somewhere else, but uh, so excited to be here. But as far as the movie, it does feel very real. And I was telling my friend earlier today, like, I just do, don't sleep that well lately you know but now I'm starting to feel more excited it's moved from anxiety to like this is exciting and Meg you're so correct you and I went in the green room you were saying this is that evidence that it is over not that I didn't know that but it is true you sometimes need that reminder that grounding reminder and that it's here to help other people so I can focus on that then you know it's like deep breath this is beautiful and exciting and I'm very honored it's awesome. And you know, you know, our theme tonight, like I said before, is educate yourself through love. I think it's kind of a, a timely topic, especially where you are sitting and where I am sitting as far as the journey we're on. Uh, I think everything that happens to us, I mean, and the same thing we're saying are just these moments. We educate ourselves and with that curiosity, that wonderful curiosity that we all are born with, that we'll learn something from our past experiences and use that wisdom to move forward. And, and our quote today is Eleanor Roosevelt. And you told me that you were very excited about this because it is a great quote. The most important thing in any relationship is not what you get, but what you give. In any case, the giving of love is an in education in itself, which, you know, if you want a good education, you study hard and practice. If you want good relationships, the same applies. And I think we're going back to the point of, you know, you've got to put the time and the effort. And certainly, even in, with a story, and I'll let you speak to that as well, the pieces of me, you know, this relationship with your children, how you never gave up, you never stopped, you kept going, even when it may have seemed very challenging. You know, I think one of the greatest opportunities is to gain a tremendous education and love from waking up, basically the experiment today is to give love to those who are not easy to love, which, you know, for me is very hard because I'm, uh, you know, stubborn and we're always like, ah, oh, wasn't my answer, you know? But you tell me, you tell me a little bit about what your thoughts are on that. And, you know, in any way you want to go with that, there's so much, there's so much to flesh out. I love what you said about, um, you know, it isn't easy. And I know I am a strong personality, very quirky. The older I get, the more I become a reclusive cat lady. And, you know, because my kids are growing out of the house. So I'm like, yes, you are right. I love, first of all, I want to say also, this lands, uh, my particular part of today, Educate Yourself Through Love, and your book is on page 57, and I am 57. So I may change that. Yes, I may change that uh, fun number at the end to this. But I love the part about that, you know, you write about that we need to really invest and educate ourselves on how to kind of till the garden of support, I like to think of. And that's an ongoing thing in our lives. I know having kidnapped yeah. children, whatever we're going through in life, not everyone has kidnapped children, but there are other people who do. But we all need support, but we're going to burn them out when we go through a hard time if we don't learn the social skills really and try really hard to be a friend before we burn through a friend you know if i didn't have <laughs> if i didn't have a core group of amazing people in alaska when i was going through this you know i was living apart from my family they weren't in the position to help anyway and um so it meant everything it did it meant everything so really investing in those relationships and learning how to be a friend to ourselves hmm. and to our other friends uh, and keep keep that up and weed through, sometimes going through our friendship group. I just think that's very, very important in being and feeling like we have the life that we want and, and that we can bring our best selves if we have that good support. 
I think that's so amazing what you point out. You know, certainly be a friend to yourself too. Don't forget that. You want to make sure that you throw yourself into the mix. And if you need to, you know, lay off a little bit and be, you know, kinder perhaps to yourself, you know, that would be a great opportunity to educate yourself in loving yourself for sure. I, I love how you said specifically that when we go through hard times, you know, we don't know when this is going to happen. Nobody knows when that shoe is going to drop. It's inevitable. We're alive, right? Everything's the right. ups, the downs. And, and we were saying in the outset of, you know, things happen. Life happens. You know, we either good, bad, indifferent. But the interesting thing is that what makes it easier, what you're saying right now is so clear and so true, are the people that surround you to hold you through and 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 I love that especially you know let's talk about your book you wrote a book called pieces of me rescuing my kidnapped daughter okay first of all oh my god mother's worst nightmare is mm. to to not have her children by her side and I, I I don't even know the emotional extent of what you were going through but tell me a little bit about that the story and then did you always intend to write it, write a memoir? I know they were covering it while you were going through the process. I know that the media had covered it a bit. You had told me that before. Great. Did you always intend to write a story about it? Let's put the story out there. You know, I did. I really did. When, uh, when this happened, this horrible thing, I'd gone through years of stalking with my former husband. So I left him on a certain year. And four years later, he took our kids and disappeared. So between the interim period, it were, was things like breaking in the house and slashing the tires and all of those things, moving close to me, calling, threatening me through the kids. So it already felt so bad that the, when the day happened that he took the kids, I made a commitment to myself that this is the end. You know, this is the end when I get my children back. I will not have to deal with that anymore. This was the end of all of those shenanigans. And I remember at one point I wrote in my journal, my life feels like a lifetime made for TV movie. I, I just need to change the channel. And when I submitted that in one of my drafts that got edited out because, you know, I'm not sure exactly why, but it still said something, a reference about a bad movie or, you know, a movie, not a bad movie, but a movie. And now it is so ironic that that is in fact the case. So we're no, talking no, no. about manifesting, right? And when you, <laughs> when I've had certain images, and this was very true with the children, I used to hold an image wow. very, very dear to myself when my kids were gone. And in that image, I would get off the airplane with my little girls and there would be people like just so excited. And I will be darned I would, when I felt really hopeless and, you know, I mean, it's a long book, a long journey, but took a couple of trips. I got arrested in Greece and many horrible things happened. But I used to just remind myself of that image, getting off the plane and the Aaron Neville, who I love Aaron Neville, that's a singer. Or if anyone didn't know that Aaron Neville sang a song, I owe you one. And I love that so much because if it weren't for people, strangers, you know, friends, all these people, friends in Greece that I made, amazing humans, I had never had my children. So that song I used to just play in that scene, and I will be darned, that scene absolutely came true. Did they play the Aaron Neville song when that? They scene? did not. That had to be in my head. <laughs> that was just in my head. <laughs> but isn't that amazing? Okay, okay, I'm not. And I'm not one who would let go of the point that you just wrote. My life feels like a lifetime made for a TV movie. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I do believe in manifesting certain things and visuals. And I'm not surprised that is coming out on Lifetime on the 5th of March. Um, but that being said, you know, going back to the, to the origins of this, your husband or your ex-husband took them to Greece, just mm -hmm. took off with your daughters. And they were very young at the time, correct? They were, they were... The height of adorability, four and six years old. Wow. And and yes. imagine. I, and so tell me, 
So when you sat down to write the story, because I like the journey, and I think that's really important, especially when we're talking to authors, you know, the whole process, and, and you know, a lot of us are told to trust the process, but we got to start the process to trust the, you know, you got to right. jump in, right? You have that inspired action, that call, I suppose, you know, to call to sit down and, and put it all out on the page, you know, day one, right? Tell me how that began for you and, and you know, where how you found yourself moving along in that well such a good question i kept some notes of course when the kids were missing so i would remember who i spoke to who was this person that person and then i kept a journal and some of the worst of it things that were super memorable and when i got home with my children finally two plus years later uh my psychology of women professors Roberta Pond, she was just amazing. She contacted me and said, you are going to forget this stuff. Some of the details will elude you. So my suggestion is, and you might not feel like this now, but my suggestion is get yourself over to my place when you can, and we'll make cassette tapes that tells you how long ago this was. We'll make cassette tapes of you telling your story. And so the things that are salient, and so years later, when you have a time, when you heal, when whatever, you'll have this to draw from. Right. She was amazing. It's such foresight. And um, so that really helped. But I had no idea, as a journalism major, I had no idea how to write memoir. And so I took classes, and I went to conferences, and I had a critique group, and all the things, and spent so much money that I really didn't have, started when I was about 30 I'm going to say 32 years old. And I was, I think I was 52 by the time it came out. Wow. And uh, I remember the first time I saw an agent and I want to say this for everyone who's thinking about writing and who feels like, Oh, that just came out. Nice. Like I saw a literary agent with like the third or fourth iteration. It had been edited professionally, all of that. And he looked like it was the most horrible thing he'd ever seen. You know, <laughs> and I, I mean, he was very honest, but he just was like, you know, you need to catch my attention within the first 40 seconds. This is not it. I don't know what the point of it is, you know, and he was good about saying he wasn't mean, but just like you have to remember, why should we care? Why should we care? We need to know that that quickly. So wow. it took so long. I love that people at writers conferences will say to you, you have to set a habit and maybe you need to be up every day at five if you work at seven or this or that. Good for you. I was a sole supporting parent. I had a paper route some of the time, full-time job and sometimes graduate school in psychology and parented kids. So when I showed up is when I showed up. And sometimes I wrote great things I thought on the back of a bill that I wasn't, I was late on paying and then mailed the bill. You know what I mean? So it was like, oh, there went that <laughs> brilliant scene. <laughs> like, whoops. <laughs> so I feel like people need to give themselves a break and do their best to create good habits but also know you know what you can show up when you can show up if it, and if it matters to you it's going to happen and don't yeah I, let people I think tear you apart and feel bad yeah that and also the fact of the matter is you said you started in your late 30s and you didn't end until your early 50s you finished the right. book the persistence factor i mean how how like how how aligned or how tied are you to that dream and and like people are saying, Rachel's saying, wow, you're crazy accomplished. Yeah, you're crazy accomplished, but you know, you put the time and energy toward it at where you could, when you could, but you didn't give up on the overarching vision. Like you didn't give up on the overarching vision with your children that you'd have them back and then people would welcome you with open arms. And, and, and now we're gonna see it played out <laughs> in, in real time. And, and I think that's so amazing. And you know, the interesting, I wanna go back to, when we were talking, and I don't remember exactly when it was, but our interview, when I had my interview with you on, on Persistence, you with Lizbeth, um, you didn't have a, you didn't have a, a, a you didn't have a, a movie in in the making or the t the Lifetime movie. So tell us a little bit about that. And plus, your book was published as a bestseller back in in what year? It, it's been a while as well, correct? The end of 2016, it was published. I don't think I got any real traction on, I don't want to say I didn't have any traction, but I, I, the real traction started happening at about year number two 
Okay. So it's one of the things that I talk to authors about in my book marketing class. It's like, you know, don't give yourself that window of despair where you're like, oh, if it doesn't happen in six months, there's just nothing that can be done. I just have to write that next book. Forget about it. No, 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 no. Take the long view of your book marketing and remember that those ridiculous, your book is too old for anyone to care about came from Barnes and Noble and the brick and mortar bookstores because they have shelves and they have to keep replenishing new stuff on their shelves. But when we started shopping online for better or worse, that kind of goes out the window. So it, my book, it took what we started talking about. I got contacted by a production company in 2018 with just this nice little question. Hey, is your book an option? And I thought they were fraudsters initially. I mean, I naturally assumed the worst in people coming from probation. I, Normally, soon every, everyone is a felon and a pedophile, and uh, they're going to stab you or cheat you. So it's a good way to live your life. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, no, actually, you're talking to someone who also feels that way, unfortunately, because okay. you're like in like that kind of industry for such a long time. It's hard to right. break yourself out. I totally right. You say. dealt with trafficking and all kinds of things. That is exactly, yeah. you know, so I was on a trip in South America and I got this email and I immediately think this can't be real. But then I went, when I got to a place where I could look it up on the internet, I was like, Oh, this actually looks like a real company. And it was an intern for the company had read my book and said, Hey, I, if, if it's not an option, I'm going to recommend that one of the producers take a look at it. So it's just this little email. Well, it took about 13 months before we signed a first auction with this company. Now, I learned in this process, but you, you really get in your book option is like somebody rents your story. They're putting down money to rent your story for a finite period of time. Yeah. But most of the time when that happens, that book is never, it does not happen that it becomes a movie. Sometimes wow. people literally option your movie rights and I'm not saying this company would do that but sometimes they do it to tamp down the opportunity for you to make a movie because there's something similar coming out and they don't want it to compete so it's a way and you know they don't have to pay you any money for an option it could be as little as zero dollars to you know more dollars but, uh, you know, in this case, it was much better than zero dollars, but they, they rented the movie rights. I didn't assume that would come to fruition. Going backwards in 1996, I optioned my movie rights and got zero dollars. It was a very good production company. It was a friend of a friend. And at the end of the year, they did not renew and said, you should write a book someday, you know. And so, uh, you, wait, so hang on, stop you, Elizabeth. So in 1996, someone came to you and wanted their option to your story before you had a book, before you had a memoir. Correct. And this, and they didn't really come to me as much as I had a friend who knew a producer. Got it. And so he contacted that producer and they were like, yes, we're interested. So we signed, I still have that little old contract. We signed, but nothing came of it. There was no nothing. I will tell you, they were very talented people because I know who the names are on the other end of that. I've seen some of the stuff they've done. They did. They would have done great. And it would have been on Lifetime. The funny part is it was always destined for Lifetime. That was foregone conclusion. Okay. So all these years later, this happens. I think, well, that's nice. Then I got to know the company a little bit, and it's a Canadian production company. So it's not Lifetime that contacted me. It was a Canadian production company. And then at the end of the first year, they still had interest to option it a second time. But then we had the pandemic. Right. And, you know, in Canada, they, they did a great job of managing their business, but they certainly weren't excited about travel or having a whole bunch of Americans come in uh, to film things. So I thought, well, this will probably never happen, but I was lucky. Anytime you have something like that, you were just fortunate to have it. Yeah. And uh, toward the end of that second option, you know, I, he, I we would meet occasionally on the phone, the producer, we have a literary or no, a film agent through the uh, publishing company also for she writes press as a film agent. So there was some communication, but he did not lose hope. The man who originally took it on, read the book, Jeff Vanderwall, read the book, felt the book. And oh, for a long period of time could say to me, my copy of the book is here. 
my copy of the book is there now. So I knew he was serious. I don't know why he was. And he and I have never had that conversation about what ah, spoke to him. Such a good conversation. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. Anyway, we must. He's just such a neat man. And I love the script writer. Um, but they let me read a couple of iterations of this script back in the day. But again, it wasn't for sure, for sure. It was going to go into production. So I set a Google alert on my, you can do this. You can set Google alerts to right. see if someone pings your name. And sure enough, I knew that they were serious. But when the, when the bell rang, they were off in Greece filming. And so I got a Google alert saying, hey, this movie is in production in Greece. I was like, wow. That is so cool. And I got a goosebumps. I was like, oh, so you, nobody even told you. You found it out on a Google alert. Which I knew they were serious. I knew that a, a stranger reached out to me and said, I'm going to try out for the part of a judge in your story. So someone found me on Facebook to do that. He wanted to ask some questions. So I knew they were serious. Don't get me wrong. But I didn't know the moment they got into production because when it happened, it was like a sprint. So they've done you know, the best. I don't need to say they weren't wonderful, but... You know, when it when they had those opportunities, they took it. I've often thought, and I, I love this, because what you're telling me is just more concluding that kind of aligns with what my thought process. You know, like every time those moments happen, it's not like something that leads up to it just happens and you're like, boom, you know, it's like, right. wow. It's like, so keep doing what you're doing because something's going on behind the scenes, right? Behind that veil right. that's working in your favor. And I know everyone who knows me knows I love the quote, Rumi's quote, live life as though it's rigged in your favor. So from 1996, that first, you know, gave you hope when, and Rachel saying, you're giving me hope. I absolutely envision my story as a movie or series. Don't we all? But the reality is manifesting is that. Literally 1996, putting seeds toward that hope that gets you writing your memoir. And then right. there you are, 2016, you've got your memoir. And I love that you call it the window despair. I think we should, you should TM that, you know, the win no, authors and the window of despair because it's all out there and the naysaying and the doubt and the whole, you know, did oh. I do the right thing? Should I, could I, would I, you know, the whole, those, those gremlins that speak to you, right? That you should completely ignore because it's just keeping you off that, process that you are on and i love this this is a great story in and of itself i i hope i hope they i, I know they have done the documentary on you in the making of the movie too correct like the whole story right. so there will be a little bit of a documentary right at the end often before the pandemic a person who'd written a book if you're doing a movie then you might be at the end of the movie or you might have some little part in it but okay. this was the great workaround so there'll be a little documentary the wonderful thing, so many wonderful things. I mean, I love Cineflix. I love the group. I love Barb Kamlaika who wrote the script. I mean, all of that was wonderful. But Lifetime, when they took it over, they literally decided to do it on a date, release the movie, premiere the movie on a date that just so happened to be the anniversary date of me leaving my former husband after he strangled me. And that's always been a significant, but, you know, kind of a sobering date. And now there's a beautiful little replacement memory that, you know, comes there. They just happen to do that. I will be away, so I won't get to be here for the premiere and see it. But you know what? That's just fine. That's just Okay, I'm getting you all over because what you're just saying is not, okay, in life, I know people think that my mentality with regard to all of this is nuts, but all of this just is makes, it's synchronistic. It makes sense. It all makes sense. Rachel's, Rachel's asking, how do you get to that point? And, and this is a great question. And let me, let me uh, like, so the point, like, so you, so like go back to that, you know, you wrote a book, you haven't given up. I see you out there. I see you encouraging. I see you supporting other authors. I see your gifts and I see your offering and your generosity and getting your name. I see it. You're not hiding behind waiting. You're not just waiting. Yeah, yeah. So when this person comes up and says, we want to option your book in what, 2018, you said they came back to you, right? Right. Where were those connections? How did you, did you reach out to them? Did they reach out to you? Someone just saw your book. This guy just found you. You just, you know, maybe when one of your offerings, you know, of your incredible generosity, tell us. Well, and thank you for saying that. Really, thank you for saying that. I did market my book like a nut bag when it first was published. And so if somebody asked me to do something, didn't matter how long the day at work was, I was there in the evening. 
I was there on the weekends. I think the first month or so I did 30 different sorts of events or interviews. So, and that was, I never took a day off during that time. So the reason I'm bringing that up is not to pat myself on the back, but to remind people that when you do that, you don't just want to do an event. You want to take the links from that event and put it on your news and events page or whatever it is on your author website, because then your search engine optimizable. Yeah. People find you. You want to be found. Same with your books. Like you want your book to have great keywords. I know I went through a hybrid publisher. She writes press. If I had done this on my own first time around, I would have tanked all opportunity because I was going to pick some obscure title that nobody would have found in a search engine. So I think those things are important because I kept the steady efforts up. For years, I didn't say, oh, I'll give it three months and then never mind. You know, I was like, nope, <laughs> I kept it up. I did all kinds of things and taught myself how to market my book. So that young woman who was the intern at the production company, she did find my book. And she said she did. She was searching for inspirational books, memoirs written by women. And that's how she found my book. And then when she liked it so much, she went ahead and talked to the production company. So that's how that happened. Now, after that, we had a series of like, you know, I met with my uh, with the publisher, then they talked to someone and then we set up a phone call. So, I mean, it wasn't just like a series of casual, informal conversations, yeah. but and it took a long time for us to even sign a contract. And again, just because you sign a contract doesn't mean count on a movie being made, but it was the start of a neat relationship. And for that, I am so fortunate but I want authors to also remember, writers and readers, that our books have a lot of different ways, whether we're, especially if we have some publishing rights over them, if we want to publish in large print, if we want to publish in foreign countries, in different countries, if we want to do audiobooks in different languages or our language, there are so many cool things that can happen and we have the potential to make money on our book. Not that that's the whole goal, 50 years past our death. 50 to 70 years past our debt. So the book's life is much longer than our own. And so it should give people hope and not despair. Don't think, oh, there's no hope. My book was published a year ago. Oh, there's no hope. It was three months and I, you know, didn't do it. But little efforts toward your marketing, plus keep writing the next thing. Keep working your job. Keep living your life. I love that you say that because it definitely offers a lot of hope. Um, I, I want to go back to a point you had said in 2018, they, they, who contacted who? I know that you said the publisher was helping you as far as the options were concerned, but was it you reaching out to this other company or they, the Canadian company came to find you again? The Canadian company, when I got that first email, when I was traveling, I responded as soon as I realized that they were a wonderful and legitimate company. And then when I got back home, well, actually when I got back home, we had this huge earthquake in Alaska and it was horrifying. But then after the dust settled from that, then we uh, had a little communication back and forth. And when it looked like that the producer could get at least the interest of some people higher up in the company, even than himself, he said, well, let's have a conversation with your publisher and you. Okay. And so that's kind of how that went. That was okay. the very first kind of more formal step. But we're still feeling it out. It was almost like you're being set up on a blind date, you know, sort of. That kind so of you are happy. You. Well, I know in, I know with She Writes Press, they let you take back your rights. So you stayed with them and you went that, that route as well because you just felt like it was what? You just thought it was a good route to go or? Uh, Meg, say that. Could you rewind that as far as taking back your rights when? No, I know. I so, may have missed something. No, so I understand, and it's just only because I am a she writes press author as well. Right. You know that you can ask, like for audio books, and for you can ask for your rights back, so you can go your own route. I don't know what I would do as far as like play, you know playing in that world. That's a whole another learning curve. But I don't. I know some people do, some people don't. And in this particular instance, you worked with the publisher to get this great deal. And now you're sitting with, with, with lifetime. So right. tell, tell, if you feel so comfortable. That's, an interesting, that's very interesting that you bring that up because I think if, if I'm hearing you right, what you're meaning is when you're about to sign the publishing contract, 
at that point, you could line through and say, I'm saving my audiobook rights or I'm going to save my film rights. I think if that's what you're saying, I've heard of, too late. I have heard of people doing that because honestly, I think most authors, if you were, especially from a legal background or you had right. seen a lawyer, you would do that. And I could have done that. And quite honestly, that could have been amazing. But the thing that's so great about me not doing, paying attention to that detail, certainly I'm splitting any money in half with the publisher because I didn't. But right. the other piece of that that's so ironic is they have a literary or film agent. And so if I didn't have them involved, I don't know that I would have the option with any money or that it would have gotten as far. So I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying I missed that detail, but it all turned out really well. And what I would say to authors always, even if you're self-publishing and you're going to, let's say, just do something exclusive with a company, you're always signing a contract. So know what you're signing. Don't right. do what I did and say, I'm so excited to do this and I'll right. just sign it and figure it out later. I'm thrilled with how it turned out, but people need to know about their intellectual property rights. Right. And, and it's interesting because you have a master's in psychology, you have journalist background, you're a, a published author, you saved your children with the help of so many people. And these other details that we all learn along the way, it's just yeah. still always a learning curve. It's like, there's always a learning curve, no matter what you do. So, you know, once again, the back to the educate yourself through love, be gentle yes. with yourself, because nobody walks into this world newborn, and they knew mm -hmm. all of this, you know, you learn. But like you said, I do always revert back to the whole synchronicity of the thing that where you are right now is all because those dots were those dots right. were coming together. So so we celebrate everything from Thank that you. point. And yes. it's, it's, it's live life as though it's rigged in your favor. This is rigged in your favor to it be was. a blockbuster and be amazing because you've got amazing actors in the Thank show you. too. The, the actress from Grey's Anatomy is playing yes. you. How surreal is that? <laughs> it's so funny, but I think I, I just think she is awesome. But one of the things that I love is that they cast two sisters to play my daughters. And so that to me is like such a heart grab right there. For me, I was like, oh, they, and then they filmed in Greece and Greece has suffered so much economically yeah. in the last decade and to give people jobs there. And it's such a beautiful country. You can't duplicate its beauty. And so that they cared enough to go there I'm like, oh, no, it has worked for us. And, you know, all of it. I don't think I would have negotiated well on my own had I had my rights the first time. You know what I'm saying? I really don't. Yeah. So if that turned out really well. I think and that's I amazing. Grateful. The fact that you're so the fact that they so the fact they went to Greece, I, I do want to come back around to the whole marketing thing and that you do offer authors marketing guidance. You have a class that you do, which is right. really wonderful. And you've had so much wisdom gained from your process I, i'm going back to your thing this window of despair is not there it is right. it, the hope and the, then you're, you continue plodding along but you actually have great tools and suzanne's saying great advice with updating your web page your website with those events those articles or those interviews that you've done so to make you find you know findability of right. you is real. So I, I would love for you to, if you could, you know, just say your web page right now. So people want to contact you because on this point, I just want to make sure I don't miss that because you are a vital resource with, with that. You have a lot of information and a lot of authors or anyone even interested in, in, you know, starting a book or at that point, who knows, you know, wherever you are on that path, that journey, they could find you and and talk to you and perhaps you know work with you is is you have a, a web page correct thank you yes i do and i just to clarify i love I, I teach book marketing on the i call it book marketing on the skinny for those light on time and budget happy to do that i think my most successful class was the the most recent one uh because we did live coaching on the weekends so that was fun so they have pre you know they buy a class where the videos and PDFs, all of that are already made. So they'll get it one week at a time. It's only four weeks long, but then taking the live coaching and working together as a group, that was so much fun. I will also say I don't help authors with their writing journey. I don't teach, 
Although my friend Margo, who's here, is an awesome editor. But um, I don't teach authors that, you know, I've given conversations and talks at conferences on writing a book with benefits. I've done that. But as far as working in courses with uh, writers about writing, I don't have any of that. And I try to do Facebook lives pretty steadily on my author Facebook page. So if people have questions, they can find me at lameredith.com. I send them an email a week with the newest podcast and stuff. But when they send questions in advance, they don't have to send questions in advance, but when they do, because they might not be there for my Facebook Live, I try to answer them on those videos that are hosted on my page. That's awesome. And and so, okay, so book marketing on the skinny, they yes. can also go to your web page as well to find you there. And what is that? www.elizabethmeredith.com or is it, it LA Meredith? Yep, it's lameredith.com. L A, because my middle name is Anne. So it's just my first, middle, and then last name, lameredith.com. That's L A M E R D I T H dot com, C O M. So I would always encourage you guys to go check it out because once I've seen your FaceTime, your FaceTime lives, they're really lovely. And I think that they give a lot of content and effort. And you're like, like I said, you're very generous with regard to the wisdom that you have shared with others, but you also offer these courses, which I think would be very helpful for anyone not knowing where to start and to basically benefit from your wisdom so far. Um, okay, so I want to show everybody your beautiful book and I think that it's really awesome the quotes that you gave me tonight and Thank I'm you. gonna read it I'm gonna read this one for everyone what I want for my daughters became crystal clear to me as I began my new life as a single parent and I know that in order for them to get there it's important that I take more than a surface glance at my unhealthy and unsafe relationship with their father only then will I ever have any hope of keeping history from repeating itself in the future, in their future. Tell me, please tell me, I mean, what does this mean to you? My God, there's so much there. When, you know, I had a pretty rocky upbringing and that would be a very big understatement, but some of it was generational. I think a lot of times people historically, especially women looked to that next man to rescue her from the first or to keep her, you know what I mean? To have a dream yeah. to be rescued. My prince will come. That's going to be enough. And uh, so there were a number of marriages that my parents had, a lot of them. And it created a lot of chaos. There were children kind of sprinkled all over, felt like. And uh, I didn't want to follow in those footsteps. And so I was in my mid-20s when I left my husband. He was a good bit older than me. And uh, I, w I left him. I had two little girls. I went to the shelter. But, and I always thought I'd get remarried. And I actually never did. I've never lived with someone since 1990, never remarried, none of that. But I really knew it was going to be important to like drill down finally and say, I've made a mess. I replicated everything I criticized my mother for, my, my upbringing for. I did. I did it all, but I amplified it and made it worse. So I've already done that. And now my kids had that legacy. What do I need to do to unschool some of that and not keep on keeping on? It's amazing. You know, and is that when you decided to get your master's in psychology after that? Well, I was just hoping to get off food stamps. I really was. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I first, I mean, literally I went to public assistance, you know, cause my husband wouldn't pay child support. So I went to welfare office and I remember the, cause, College did seem too great for me. It just did. I, I, my parents were two high school dropouts and I didn't have the self-esteem. I don't think it wasn't like they wouldn't have believed in me. I think they would have, but I didn't think that was in my future. And so I went to the public assistance office with my two little squirmy, dirty kids and was signing up. And the woman's like, did it ever occur to you to finish your degree? You know, you had some classes and I'm like, finish my degree. Do you know how old I'd be if I finish my degree? I'm going to be 28 before I could even imagine having the degree. And she was like, well, sweetie, how old do you think you're going to be in a few years anyway? <laughs> I was like, uh, got it. So yeah. then it was just little baby steps. Get off public assistance. Get the college degree. Get off housing assistance. Get a roommate. Get, you know, little things, but they started building one for another, one on another. I had a wonderful instructor, Ginny Carney. She was my literature of Appalachian women instructor. 
And she really helped me feel important. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for everyone, that because we all are important. It wasn't just me. But she really had a heart for people who were suffering. And she also introduced me to this writer who actually I just reached out to last year. She is amazing. She won a Pulitzer Prize for her work in Lexington, Kentucky. But she was someone who way in the day in the 80s, she started following as a reporter, judges and police officers who refused to make arrests, arrests and domestic abuse and wow. published their addresses, their pictures oh. and their addresses. She stalked them. And Kentucky started changing. the, And it just occurred to me, like, we could hold systems accountable. And so it really that helped. That was like a pivotal point where I'm like, hey, you know, we're all important. We, there may be billions of us, but we can all make a difference. Wow, that's amazing. You know, and it's interesting that you did end up in the federal government, you know, in, in the, was that after you finished your master's or was it during the process? It's interesting. Now, I did end up in state government. I was state. first, I was working as a domestic violence advocate when I was getting off food stamps. I had a other little sales job, which was trifle. But then I took a job as a domestic violence advocate. And while I didn't make any money, I met the most dynamic people. I loved my boss. She was someone to admire, very powerful, but all my coworkers, amazing. Loved working with uh, survivors of domestic abuse. I loved it. Yeah. And then my kids were taken. You know, I had that job a couple years and my kids were taken and it was a great, supportive, beautiful place to be. I don't know where, if I would have gotten my kids back without their help. So after that, I went to work as a child abuse investigator while I was in graduate school. And because I couldn't get insurance for the kids and I couldn't, they, they were uninsurable because they'd been exposed to basically God knows what. And so right. no one would insure them. Wow. This was way before Obamacare and all of that. So I got a job as a child abuse investigator. And then eventually I went to work as in my internship with adult probationers, sex offenders were my interest and um, interest in the appropriate professional way. I should just clarify. Right. Um, and then as I was about to be employed, I <laughs> went to work with juveniles. And wow. because their brains are not fully developed till they're almost 30, there's so much hope. Yeah. And it really depersonalized the way the system had failed. When I was going through the criminal justice system, the way the system failed would have forever been personal had I not gone to work in a place where it was like, oh, this wasn't personal. There's always so much more need than there are resources. And I can do a lot of work and forgive and move on and see if I can help anyone. And I made huge messes in my work too. And so it helped. Yeah, I, you know, I want to go back to, you've said it many times, and it's hope. It's hope. And, and really, I think in many ways, be it the experience you had um, in, in your early years when you, you know, literally had nothing, you left your husband and had nothing, and then your girls were taken from you, and then you felt like that was hopeless. And then you were supported by all these people and this job that you had because you no know, and Rachel saying that someone's offhanded remarks advice can change a person's life. So Lord only That's knows true. what you did for those juveniles while you were there. Mm -hmm. it, it's you. just that continue because you don't give up hope because right. you never give up hope. And maybe you had moments where you felt like you wanted to throw your arms up, your hands up yes. in there. I'm sure, I'm sure you could tell us about those, you know, and you did in, in your book. And, and that's what makes it connectability to others. And that story is so important to give people hope because what you share is tr your truth and your experience. And, you know, one of the things mm -hmm. I love, you know, as far as the process of unfolding, and I want to get to this because I think that, you know, we learn so much about ourselves and I want to hear what is it that you've learned about yourself coming from nothing almost? You said your parents were both dropouts and you, you know, clearly educating yourself beyond any of their wildest dreams. And then, you know, what happened with your girls and now where you're sitting, tell us a little bit about the unfolding and, and, and the highlights. I think the best highlights you can, you can share tonight of your journey. Thank you. Um, and I really appreciate you saying that. And I, I would say, you know, 
I don't ever get to a place. I think there are things that I can do. Like I have hope. That's a good thing. Always had hope. I've always believed that I was um, not, maybe not always. No, I pretty much always believed that I was loved by a creator. Really did. But don't believe I'm better than anyone else. Don't believe I'm worse than anyone else. And there was a time where I felt like I was worse than everyone else. Um, that helps. That really does help. And um, having a sense as a child that my life was a story. And for all of us, there is a beginning that we inherited. Mm. And then there is the middle. And it's why I like working with middle, you know, midlife women. Um, there's a middle where we can start to help influence more. We have a little bit more autonomy and control. It doesn't mean we have total control. I would never say to someone, yeah. you can positively think your way into it, you know, everything you want, or you can try this. Or no, 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 no. We have a certain amount of influence. And absolutely, it's important to be responsible with it. But then we get to have an ending too. And we all want to know what we'd like our ending to look like so we can reverse engineer the middle. And I think some of that was very healthy to have that detached look. So when my kids were kidnapped, I went straight to work the next morning. I didn't sleep, but I went straight on to work. Part of that is super creepy. And it's why when you and I were talking in the green room, some of those defense mechanisms really don't serve me that well now. That just means I'm a big weirdo because <laughs> those feelings didn't and emotions didn't connect back nicely. You know, I learned to be detached and removed, but that's no way to live your entire life. And, you know, if you ask my daughters, it can tell you it's exceptionally disappointing that I have an inability to cry with them. That's very disappointing. But I always know that, you know, I have some strengths and some things that are well tried, and then I have enormous deficits. And so, I'm thankful for what I have and I try not to take left-hand turns when I'm driving because that's one of my anxiety pieces. It's like <laughs> literally really? life defining it is. <laughs> and uh, you know, I do the best I can, but I got lots of dysfunction that I still, you know, have plenty of work ahead of me. <laughs> so, so I will say this because I want you to go back to what you just said. You say you have enormous strengths and yeah, you have deficits too. Thank you. But you have enormous strengths and you keep building on that foundation that you have and you had because of really, really big challenges in your life. And I think that even with regard to the whole, you know, getting my book out there, your book out there, everyone's book out there, the whole process, the story, I mean, really it's beautiful because your intention, this is what we were saying before I, when I asked you, and I'm going to put this up here because it's, it's super exciting, you know, stolen by that's the, that's the, um, the picture of the lifetime movie that's coming out. Uh, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about it? It's, it's big debut. And how do you feel about, you know, this is happening? Right. Well, um, I was saying earlier that there's a lot going on in my own personal life. So there's, it feels surreal. I can't say that I have been super excited, really. Um, I've been anxious and feeling like, do I deserve this? What's it going to be like? You know, this, that, is this the right thing? And sometimes I've been really happy about it. But for the most part, in the last month or so, I kind of don't want to talk about it. And that's sort of all people want to talk about, you know, that you know me. <laughs> And so it's like really awkward. I'm like putting my phone on do not disturb. But then I think moments like this or like I got to see, a, you know, a snippet of it today, the unedited version. I'm not going to see it with the rest of the world because I'll be out of range of the Internet. But on the other hand, now I just feel like, oh, this is so neat. I just feel so honored and so grateful. And if nothing else, who knows what the future holds in life? But this is a moment that I will remember. And one thing that I loved about how things shook out with the pandemic and us not being on set, my daughter's friend did those little girls that played them on the movie on Instagram. And so they had this back and forth conversation. And my oldest daughter is very much a curmudgeon -y introvert, kind of like me, but more. And so she was like, this is going to be dreadful. I just know this is going to be dreadful. And then she meets this little girl who's a young lady rather. And the young lady says to her, all I want to do is to be the very best Marianthe I could be. 
And my daughter was like, I love this movie so much. I can't wait for it to come out. This is the best thing that ever happened. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Wow, I, I it. just can imagine. I think there's going to be a lot of healing that you went back and said, the fact of the matter is it's coming out on the same day of memory yes. is being changed to something very positive and definitely um, offering a ton of hope to a lot of people who might be going through this. Um, I, 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 I want to go back to at the beginning of our interview, I asked you to set your intention for this evening and can you share that with us and then share the number that you picked and with, yes. with everyone as far as the book is concerned? Yes. I, okay. So, sh so back to the intention, I do want to look this year at some of my coping mechanisms and kind of do a little cleanup, maybe audit some of them and s double check what, what's no longer serving me and see if I can grow a little bit past that. It'd be great to cry with my daughter as an example, you know? So, I mean, not that we don't laugh together because we do that very easily and very well. There's lots of kidnapping jokes in my family, believe it or not. <laughs> so. If you don't laugh and cry, right? Laughter is the best. Thing. I'll tell you. And, you know, my my daughter said on an interview this morning that when I cry, I sound like a rhino, which I don't know. <laughs> I was like, what is wrong with you? But anyway, she meant it just like I just let I let loose. So I have the opposite problem as you do, Elizabeth. I am Italian to my core, and the emotions pour out. Like I'm hearing when your daughter was talking about that beautiful young lady who's playing her, and how you know she wants to be the best Mariana that she can be. And I'm like, oh, I'm already crying. I'm like, so there you go. Like, she thought of something. But so tell us the number you picked. Number in, in the eight. I love the number eight. Well, so eight now is an affinity number. It's full circle. You know that, right? Eight is a numerology. It comes back to full circle. And one of the coolest things about eight is that you come back to a place of spiritual reawakening. And I think that's so fantastic that you picked eight. So go ahead and read number eight. And what does it have to share in light of your beautiful intention? We're talking about page eight on your book, correct? Yes, correct. Yep. Okay, good. I'm on it. I did kind of love page 57 where we were at simply because I'm 57 for the next seven months. So that was also awesome. Hold on one little second. Kindle is a little slower for me. Oh, wait a minute. I just learned it. Never mind. It's very easy. Here we are. Magical key to bliss. Take a magical ride. Rent a movie that inspires you. So what is the insight? What is the magical insight for the day? What is the theme? The, the, the highlight, the title? <clears throat> Remember, life is an adventure. Amen. And you know what's so amazing? I was that my podcast yesterday that, that I was recording, he was exactly talking about exactly that. Life is an adventure. Life is an adventure. Oh my God. Is there anything on that um that insight that speaks to you? Because of our routines, we forget that life is an ongoing adventure. I love that by Maya Angelou. Uh, it's interesting because at the outset you're like well you can't really stay to a fixed routine all the time you're going to do your best and then you know let it let it let it ride because you've got to do what you can to get where you want to go and enjoy the moments as well you were saying that especially you know especially now when even you can't i mean you're not even getting upset that you can't see it with everyone else but you know it's going to be out it's going to feel right as it there because i'm telling you there's going to be well, well i'm going to tell you i'm going to watch the part and i'm going to text you i'm going to say this is awesome <laughs> so, i'll be out of text range so don't don't pardon me pardon if i don't get right it. anyway <laughs> so all the little special messages when you get back into range for sure but go ahead please speak what you're but you say. know what's wonderful about it because i do feel like this was a very good thing for you know i will be with one of my kids during this okay. time so i do feel like that in itself could be the best thing to be able to see this later and to, you know, to just appreciate that it's happening. I it. But I have found that habits, building good habits and traditions, it's something that's like absolutely saved me, you know, added structure, gotten me from to move the needle from goal to goal. But I suffocate in those habits too. Mm -hmm. And so I like this because it's so important to throw all of that away sometimes and say, no, 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 at some point that's not healthy to be so rigid and 
life is an adventure and we need to get out of our routines and do something different. So, you know, Suzanne's asking a great question about the title and she's asking, did they keep the title? Is the movie title the same as the book? And it's not, but you actually had two iterations, uh, iterations of the title of the movie as well. So why don't you speak to that? Yes, it's interesting because I think a lot of times people feel like, uh, or the, the assumptions people make uh, on a title, like I might have made before, it's like, okay, they chose a title. It wasn't my book title, which is fine. If it's in a certain series, you know, like a movie series, they need to keep it sort of uniform to other movies they've released. So they had chosen a title called Stolen Hearts, colon, The Elizabeth Meredith Story, which would make it searchable, which was great. And then last minute after all of the publicity went on about Stolen Hearts, The Elizabeth Meredith Story, all the actors Instagramming from Greece and doing all the things they're supposed to be doing. A couple of weeks ago, they changed the title and the actors were as shocked as anyone and you know so that happens that happens they may have a different way of doing it. and then one person i talked to recently said you know the thing is it's very findable and when people hear the title someone even joked on twitter about it like stolen by their father but this woman tweeted this yesterday and it cracked me up she said that title's not giving me anything and then she wrote little <laughs> laughing emojis you at least know what it's about yeah. so no, I had to kind of fight a little bit or not fight necessarily, but really advocate assertively for myself to see if they would include the title of my book, even in the opening credits, because that's not a given. And they also don't typically include a publisher of a book. So that was did stay, but they did include in the opening credits, the title of my book. So my oh, book is Pieces of Me, colon, Rescuing My Kidnapped Daughters. The movie is stolen by their father and they kindly open it. Thank you to Cineflix and Lifetime for allowing that. Uh, they put that there. So I'm excited. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, you know, like I backed the life is rigged in your favor. Yes, that's awesome. I think that that is going to be awesome. And I think that, you know, obviously everyone here is sending out the best energy and well wishes you. your way for continued momentum into the direction of your dreams as they unfold. I, I do want to go back. There's one question that we have here about um, whether or not you had a film or TV agent. Um, not We already know how you got Lifetime's attention. It was through the, the company, correct? Or through the actual right. director? Right. I had nothing to do with getting Lifetime's attention. The production company did that after they, you know, they had to work really hard to get anyone's attention to say, hey, could we find funding? Could we find people to act? Could we find... And they did, Jeff Vanderwall especially, did all of that. At the last minute, Elizabeth Smart jo joined on a name to help get the word out. And what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful, I can't imagine anyone better to join in and help get the word out. And then there was another part of it that you asked. So my publisher had a film uh, film agent that, who is a lawyer that they like working with. I didn't have to choose her, but they already knew her and had a relationship. And thank goodness, because she's brilliant. And so, again, that's one of those ways. Like, I didn't think to separate out my rights when I was doing my contract, but that kind of worked out really well. Yeah. So so it was through the publisher you got the film agent. I'm just speaking to her question. Correct. And then the, the Jeff was the one who got Lifetime's attention with regard. And then Elizabeth Smart came on after the right. fact, which is just amazing delightful yeah, delightful she's my, my god her story how aligned is it oh my this? i just she is just fabulous you know the picture of resilience i love the script writer who i need to email tonight but script writer barb come like as someone who's just written amazing scripts before and she was so kind like just terrific to talk to on the phone they really wanted you know when you do a book to movie characters have to go by the wayside uh, you have to combine characters. You have to make it short enough, right, to keep people's right. attention and to fund it. Amazing. But they were so respectful in how they did every bit of it. That's amazing, Elizabeth. And, you know, like I said, back to the whole celebratory congratulations for this. because. No minor effort here. We all know who are authors are listening, who are even not authors listening. It's not a minor effort to first write a book and get your story on the page. And then I'm sure the whole process, as you've already, you know, you relayed tonight, has been just keep taking the next best step and keep moving forward and keep going. And, and I really do hope you enjoy this. 
do I do? I, I do. I hope you do. Sit. Like someone said to me, and it's so funny on the, on the, you know, my 22nd wedding anniversary was on Saturday and someone at my wedding Happy said to me, thank you. But, um, it's interesting because they said, stand back and take it all in was a great advice because it becomes mm -hmm. crazy in the whole, you know, like you're saying, your anxiety's kicked up. People are calling you. If you take a moment to stand back and just take, and we were talking about this too, the moment of your life, nothing is absolutely perfect, but right. everything is exactly where it needs to be at that time. And I hope you do that. And I hope you definitely, you know, congratulate yourself, give yourself a lot of self-love, educate yourself with self-love. You've come a long way, my friend, and Thank we you. are all, all proud of you and we congratulate you and we celebrate you. And I want you to give us a final bit of inspiration tonight so that we can all take it on our journeys with us from your particular wisdom and the world, your remarkable adventure, you know, remember the journey and adventure here. Tell us a little bit about wisdom or inspiration that we can take with you, take a little of you with us tonight. I think, and thank you for that. I have so adored being here. And I think, especially as someone who struggles with anxiety at times, often, um, one thing is that keeps coming up for me is not to tell ourselves as authors, as humans, as anyone, if only this thing would happen, everything would be perfect because that again puts pressure on that thing and there are so many alternate routes to contentment and the things yeah. that should be happening in our lives and we can miss out on a lot of joy if in fact we're saying to ourselves if only this then that it, it sets up a huge disappointment and so i have learned with this that i'm not going to do that i cannot do that i'm not saying to myself I wonder if this is going to do this thing or that thing or, or whatever. You know, there's some details I'm trying to get in order before I leave for my trip. But taking that moment to say, this is amazing. And there's the rest of life and my friends' lives and other things concurrently happening. And it's all part of the big plan. I, I love that. I, I absolutely love that. I always say, the magic is there. We're looking for something else and it's right in front of us. And those are the magical connections that we can take with us. And, you know, you don't want to look back and say, I wish I had that moment again to live it differently. What you just told us is so important. It's so profound. You know, don't, don't act as if something has to happen and then everything will be fine. Just enjoy the fine that's there right now and the find that's there right now. I, I want to share with everybody, you know, one more quote, because I think this is beautiful. And you've shown the wonderful persistent you of Elizabeth that is in this quote, what I wanted for my daughters became crystal clear to me as I began my new life as a single parent. And I know that in order for them to get there, it's important once again, that I take more than a service client, my unhealthy, unsafe relationship with their father, only then will I ever have any hope of keeping history. I know we did that. Okay, let's do this again. I'm so sorry. I think I did that same quote. It's the same one, a different one. Oh my goodness, I'm embarrassed. But anyway, hang on one more, one more second, one more second, one more second, because it was the next one. I'm so sorry. I get to read that again. How beautiful. And this is it. This is the one. I, okay, this is the coolest thing because it's your daughter's inheritance. And I love the picture of you holding them. I don't want any of these horrifying experiences to define my daughter's futures. Instead, let the strength we have on earth, the connections we have made, the travel we have enjoyed, and the great we've experienced be what we hold on to. Let these be my daughter's inheritance. And that speaks to what you just said, what you just said. Tell me just in a second more what that means to you, because it's so freaking profound to me. It's so hey. profound. Actually, and I just remember now that I feel I love that. Actually, I do love that. Um, it's really important for us to decide what we're going to take away, that we have choices about how we're going to respond to what the world brings us and that we look for not just what awful things. I mean, I have mentioned before that I have a few uh, dysfunctional uh, th things that I have continued to schlep along with me, but there are so many other things, the friendships, the travel, the things that came that would have never happened without this awful thing happening. I'd never say, boy, I'm so glad my kids were kidnapped. Not ever. 
but I really wanted my kids to, to have some of these as their takeaways. And you know what? They really do. They really do have those loves of culture, of people, of travel, of being a student of the world. And I do appreciate that. That's amazing. And, and I want everyone to see this beautiful cover, Pieces of Me, Rescuing My Kidnapped Daughter is get a copy because it's definitely worth your while to read it. And then go watch the movie, the Lifetime movie on March 5th. Me. And let us all celebrate this wonderful new date for Elizabeth as the past falls away, all the past pain and hurt falls away. We get to celebrate with a wonderful new opportunity of healing, which I think is just amazing. And we all send out the love to you and, and, and everyone's saying, enjoying what your great advice was given and, and how profound and how profound your life is. I definitely want to show my butterfly awakens because if it was not my butterfly awakens, I would not have met this beautiful woman, Elizabeth. And as I say, always that journey, this journey has brought me some incredible magical connections. Um, so thank you, Elizabeth, for this evening. Congratulations to you. We celebrate you. you. I want everyone to go in, into her webpage, lameredith.com once again, and mm -hmm. check out all the great stuff she has there. Persistence You with Elizabeth on her FaceTime, Ellie Meredith on, face, on Facebook. So you can go into that as well. I want everyone to remember that they are the deliberate creators of their life. Let us dream big and all together raise the positive vibrations in this world. It's time to manifest the life of your dreams. Wishing you all love and bliss and congratulations. And we all can't wait for your movie. Thank so, you. Bravo. Thank Have you a for making it fun. Oh my God, you, you are amazing. I, I, I told you, you are effort vessant in your personality and I've enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you for being with me tonight, oh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Congratulations. The joy was mine. Thank you. Thank you so much. It felt like a party. It did. It was. This is your Margo party. And I, it did. It felt like a party. I'm like, I, Margo and I were talking today about a party, you know, and that I, and this was like it. So thank you for that. Oh my God. We are so proud of you as, as a SWP writer and author. We're so proud of you and we couldn't be more happy for you and continued blessings and success as you take in all those moments, like you said. So thank, thank you, you Liz. Thank Everybody you, have a wonderful evening. Educate yourself with love. I think that's a great theme and go out to the rest of February and do that. And we'll see you at the next show. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.